I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick you out because then it's less people on the screen. So the, the only issue, Paul, is I think last time you kicked me out, I couldn't rejoin later on. Oh, okay. Well, let me try again. Okay. Please. <laughs> 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 Your concern is duly noted. Let me try again. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! I don't know. We have too much fun, guys. I, don't know. I think he's good. I think he's back in the attendance. So can, Liam, I think raise your hand, Liam, if you can, oh, okay. if you're good. Well, I think you're good. Try again. Okay. <laughs> uh, now I got the YouTube playing in the background. All right, we are live on YouTube. And Betsy might just be a little bit. She has some technology issue so she my guess is she might be a couple minutes late so Joy. peter did you want me to do any screen sharing for you while you chair the meeting or do you want to just like do you want to do it if somebody references a certain section or it's up you your call yeah no probably you're probably a lot more technical savvy than i am so okay so we'll have share. okay you, so you're going to chair it but i'll just like if you know if it makes sense to pull up a certain section i'll do that how's that sound? sure Okay, I think I'm gonna get started. Uh, so, welcome everybody. This is the uh, Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 uh, virtual town council workshop. And this is in regards to our TIF policy. Uh, we'll do a quick attendance. Tom, you wanna take a quick attendance? Certainly, uh, Councilor Clucci. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Here. Hamill. Here. Councilor Gleistein. She is here, she just popped in. Okay, and Chairman Johnson. Here. Uh, so with that, um, I think I've told everybody here, but for those that are in the audience and watching at home, uh, Mr. Peter Hayes is our chair of finance. And I think it's safe to say finance has spent the most time with this policy. <laughs> so uh, Peter is going to chair this workshop and I'll just go, I'll help him out on the back end, pulling up uh, certain sections of the policy if need be. So with that, Peter, uh, it, is, it is all yours. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining everybody tonight that, that's in the audience, possibly listening in. Um, yeah, this policy, I think, Tom, has been around for the better part of a year, probably, in various different forms of review. I think it, where did it start? Did it start it in? Started the rules and policies, policy. and as I recall, it started um, immediately on the heels of the Crossroads CEA being approved in December of 18. So it was the spring of 19 that this started in rules and policies. So I think they took sort of a first crack at, at the text here and then it then came to the finance committee and we have gone sort of back and forth on it on different revisions, different changes and actually different finance committee members. Um, both John and Betsy have contributed to this version. I think this was distributed earlier to town council members and available to the public. Um, and with that, I'm not sure um, what the pleasure of this group would be. I think at this point, people have had a chance to see it and study it. I didn't know if there's any comments, questions, any place, you know, you'd like to have greater detail. The, the Finance Committee is, is here to talk about it, and I'm sure Tom can bail us out. This was sort of a co-authored <laughs> yeah. document that, that has lived in many forms. Yeah. Um, Peter, if I could, maybe I'll just, uh, for purposes of the council and your discussion, this policy is really specifically focused on economic development uh, TIFs with CEAs. And it's really the CEA component that is uh, the, the, the impetus behind uh, the policy. Um, there was some talk at the committee level that there may need to be companion policies for other types of credit enhancement agreements, uh, uh, the affordable housing kind but the, this policy uh, was not drafted with that in mind. And, and I think just some highlights as you go through it, it kind of, you know, sets out the purpose, which for purposes of public, I can read the purpose of this policy is to outline standards and processes of the town of Scarborough will use in initiating or considering applications for tax increment financing, TIFs, and for credit enhancement agree agreements, notwithstanding this policy, the creation of a TIF district and adoption of a development program is a decision made on a case-by-case -case basis by the Scarborough Town Council and the, and the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development, Maine DECD, must, all, must also review all TIF districts for statutory compliance. 
So that was sort of the architecture. It goes through some rules and conditions. Um, and then it kind of talks about the process by which it will happen. Um, Thomas Glacing then actually introduced a sort of scoring matrix that we can use to kind of evaluate the different CEAs that come in front of us and, and TIFs and kind of use it as a way to kind of help guide the town staff in, in assessing whether they want to bring it forward to the council and some criteria for the council to use and possibly trying to decide which, which ones that come before the, the future town councils make sense based on some criteria. Um, so with that, I don't know if there's, there's any questions from the counselors or comments from the counselors as, as we work on this. Um, Councilor Gleison, I think I saw your hand go up first, so. Yeah, so I just wanna make a couple of comments. Um, so we've worked, you know, and Tom can attest to this, we, we, we work to kind of try to clean up the language and I'm not saying we did it perfectly, but um, you know, it, it's unlikely, we have a very large TIF district, which is a tax increment financing district that will expire in about 26, 27 years. So certainly there may be others that come along after it. Um, and again, this isn't related to affordable housing, um, but it's, it's probably unlikely that we'll have another TIF. So this is really focused on CEA or the credit enhancement agreement. And um, people, uh, you know, will get those terms mixed up a little bit. And we, we tried to clean that up in the document to, to make it clear that, you know, what, what makes a TIF um, unusual uh, is how much we're putting aside uh, to shelter um, from the tax dollars and whether or not we're um, taking, uh, giving tax dollars back from that TIF to the requester. Uh, so even if a TIF is not requested, this policy will come into play. And um, in terms of the scoring, um, we, we kind of talked about how do you look at subjective data and try to make it as objective as you can in terms of ranking and um, point scales. So the idea would be the person who's requesting the CEA would actually rank themselves on a point scale. And I would like to say that, you know, this is the first time we're workshopping this. Hopefully you guys have seen it. If there's other scoring values that you think we should be looking at or the point scale isn't quite what you think it should be, that is definitely an area where you should weigh in because that ultimately should be some, you know, the, the point scale should be something that reflects all of us as our, our values as a town. Um, and so at that point, um, we would we would either, you know, there's a couple of different ways we can go. The finance committee at that time can, can score it against the point scale. Um, you know, we could all score it and then, you know, some are average the scores or things like that but it allow us to kind of look at things relative to each other. So if something hits all the boxes, um, it's going to, it's actually gonna score pretty high. If it doesn't, uh, it may not make it to the next level. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of uh, at this point, the, uh, uh, what I wanted to add, Peter. Thank you. Councilor Katarina, do you, do you, yeah, I saw your hand. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, I know the TIF and CEA policy is pretty well set in state statute. Um, so I, I was curious, number one, um, do surrounding towns have this policy or scoring system? Um, and the reason I ask that is um, just for, uh, so we aren't reinventing a wheel here. And secondly, I'm a little bit concern that I don't want to be boxing in any potentially creative or good CEAs that come along in the future. Maybe right now this, this scoring system will work, but in a different economic climate or whatever, maybe it wouldn't. Um, and also um, I'm assuming, but I should never assume that the um, uh, Ms. Muller, our uh, attorney has weighed in on thoughts on this. Um, so I'm just curious, has she weighed in? What are her thoughts or feedback? Um, and is this something that's being done in other towns? And if not, why not? 
Yeah, so there, I know it's uh, a lot. Sorry. No, there are a couple of questions there. Um, Tom, I see your hand. I know Betsy will probably have some on whatever parts of those questions that Jean Marie. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take a stab at uh, as many of them as I can get to. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the outset, Jean Marie, we did do a kind of statewide search. Uh, there certainly are other examples. As I recall, the starting point really focused on Kittery, excuse me, uh, Freeports and, and Portland's policy. Okay. I think we've kind of come a, a fair distance from those starting points, frankly, at the ending document. Uh, we did consult with the town attorney, uh, Shana Mueller, uh, initially, but we've not really brought her into the process since. So uh, she's not looked at the draft as it currently um, is constructed. Um, is there a plan to have her do so? I mean, just to let us know if there's anything that triggers something that may not be up to snuff with what the state statutes and regulations are, sure. <clears throat> excuse me, around this. Sure, I, I think that would be probably uh, wise to make sure that we're not uh, in violation of any statutory requirement. But at the end of the day, this is a policy and it's a legislative action of council. So I right. think she'll stop short of advising right whether it's the right thing to do or not. Um, right. I think she can offer an opinion about its compliance with state law. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yep. Councilor Hamill? Yeah, um, I, I thought this was great work and I, I know it's gone a long and winding road to get here. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, it was thorough, comprehensive. You know, I like the notification requirements. You know, I, I kind of went back and forth on the scoring system. At first I thought it was a little onerous and maybe a little bit uh, a little bit too much, but uh, I think it's a nice addition. I think it would be a useful tool to screen applicants, and I don't, I don't really lie in fear that it's, you know, the it's going to be seen as a hurdle that's too high for, for serious applicants to get over. So, so I, I kind of, you know, I kind of like that, um, those features and those aspects of it. So, um, I did have a couple questions. One was, uh, is it current practice to require master plans or subdivision plans to be developed? fully before, um, before an applicant, uh, you know, is seeking a TIF or a CEA. I, I can certainly address that. It, it, it's not typical that they have completed that. It is typical that before it starts or before it's finalized that um, it, they would have that in, in place or before it starts, but not before. Okay. And as Councilor Gleistein, um, foreshadowed earlier to the extent that uh, we are considering CEA requests within existing TIF districts. Um, they're likely to be lot specific. I'm not, um, mm -hmm. not, not for certain, but more often than not, I would expect it would be for a single lot. So it wouldn't be subdivision, but certainly site plan. And uh, gaining this sort of financial partnership with the town would likely be a pretty important part of the initial due, due diligence. So as Karen said, I wouldn't expect it to be in hand at the time of application, but certainly uh, incorporated and made part of any final uh, decision. Great, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Gleisting. Uh, yeah, so I think those were all great points. Um, I, you know, I think having the town attorney look at it is a good idea to make sure. Um, you know, the law is fairly straightforward, and uh, but it it never hurts <laughs> to make sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so the scoring system, um, we had from the initial draft, there was a lot of questions that the um, applicant would have to answer. So we had, you know, just several questions, like 10, 10 15, 20 questions. Value you bring with this. And then we actually had the state application in, which had pages and pages of questions that the applicant has to answer, not for CEA, because that's more of our purview, but for a TIF. And so we actually removed that. So we're trying to make, cut down the barriers for the people that are coming forward. So we consolidated down the questions. We took out the state TIF application because in reality, as we talked about it, if there is another TIF, that's us, the town of Scarborough, who's applying for that tip. That's not the actual um, person who, you know, is going to do the development. They will, of course, work with us, but they will actually, uh, we will actually apply for the tip through the state because this, we're trying to talk the state into letting us shelter revenue. And so the CEA, we wanted to focus on what value they believe they're bringing to us 
in order to get a tax rebate um, from the new uh, value that they would bring. And so we consolidated, I think, Tom, you took a couple of the questions and we even kind of, you know, meshed them into the scoring system. And we're not going to be tied to a hard and fast scoring system. I want to say another thing. We also talked as a committee about, you know, do we want to say, you know, what's a threshold that we even want to work on this at all? And we pretty much decided we don't want to shut the door on anything. Um, we want it to be able to go through some level of the process, which at the very first one is through SEDCO. You know, so there was discussion about how early do we want to even say, you know what, you know, this, this, this isn't even anything anybody should be talking about. But we were very careful not to shut those down because anything is worth trying to take it forward. Um, I think the uh, one of the main goals was to try to get the um, council informed a little earlier. I think, um, you know, that is is uh, probably will help overall in terms of people understanding what's being requested and what we might need or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, those were some of the overlying goals. Um, certainly, you know, if people have amendments or they think things should change, I would certainly encourage people to do that. But, you know, we definitely did not have a goal of shutting it down. It's more transparency and getting good information and trying to put some kind of rational way I mean, we could still look at something. I don't know if you guys have ever worked on scoring systems like this, but every now and again, you, you score something and you, it comes out at 30, but your gut still tells you, you know what, this is, this is something we ought to be doing. You know, there was, there will still be that subjective part of that, but this will allow the, the person requesting the CEA to tell us, you know, how well do they meet, you know, new energy guidelines, you know, like what do they think they're providing on that front and value for the value of the town? And then we can listen to them and say, yeah, we think you do provide that or no, we don't think you do. So that, that was, that was some of the goals, you know, it's not perfect. I'll, I'll tell you that it was when I first heard about it, I'm like, oh, this is a no brainer. It was much more difficult than <laughs> it seemed like it would be. So. If I could, Peter, I just want to follow Sorry. up on Councillor Gleistein's point. Uh, the uh, the scoring matrix in Appendix C, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion at Finance Committee about whether there should be a minimum score uh, to be attained to, to kind of move through, and there was a decision not to include that. Um, I wonder if we should uh, be explicit in that regard, if that would be helpful, that to actually state that there, you know, there need need not be a minimum score. I think this process was really intended to be consistent and to bring every project through the same sort of process and to encourage kind of critical thinking on these major, uh, I'll say policy objectives or priorities, however you want to characterize them. Um, so I would, do you think that would be helpful to just add a sentence to maybe the uh, Appendix C that talks about no minimum score required and what the purpose of this exercise is intended to do? I personally think that that would be fine. I think, you know, one of the other things we added is that besides staff time, if we incur outside costs, if we hire a consultant to look at this, if we have a legal fees, that's going to be on the dollar side of, you know, once even after they use up the deposit, we're going to ask for them to put down, that's going to be on them to pay up, pay for our expenses to look at the CEA. So if somebody came out with a low score, and they think, well, I probably don't have much chance of getting this through, and there's a lot more expenses to come. You know, they may say, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go forward. Um, but yeah, I, I, I personally don't have a problem with adding that because I think, you know, any kind of policy, personally, I think <laughs> you certainly want to use it a little bit, and it may become apparent that, you know, let's put a, let's put, let's put a minimum on this. Um, but before that, I think you kind of want to use the tool and the policy and see how it's working. So that would be my opinion on it, Tom. Okay. And, and actually just to build on a little bit, and I think Council Howard, just to kind of build on your question and a little bit of Councillor Katarina's, I think our objective at, at a 30,000 mile view was to, you know, the anticipation is that the, you know, we may get more of these applications down the road as we do these, these sort of deals and economic development. And what we really want to do is just maybe create a more sort of objective way for them to come through the pipeline rather than subject, at least have some mechanism that kind of 
the staff can kind of use to determine whether it should be brought forward. Certainly our part of the way for the town council in their future to kind of look at past and future deals. I do think there should be a concern about how do we make sure we consistently apply sort of some of our rationale and thoughts. I know, you know, as a city councilor, sometimes it's hard to know what was decided before you actually. So I think it was all of that to be clear. Tom, to get to your point, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think remaining silent on it is fine. We're not really, you know, we didn't say there there is a minimum. We just, you know, we really just said we really trust future town council members that give it, this gives, in my opinion, when we drafted it, it was really drafted in a way that will give town council members of the future some tools to use, but nothing that ties their hand to any particular course of action. They can, ultimately, the decision is the sitting town councilors as these come before them. Um, but we just wanted to provide a framework that would bring some consistency to how we evaluate these past, present, and future, if that makes any sense. Yeah, agreed. I'm just trying to avoid, uh, uh, I guess, the case that Jean Marie mentioned, which the applicant will do self scoring and it scores a 35, let's say, and uh, without any word otherwise that may discourage what otherwise is an interesting and, and good application that ought to go forward and maybe be approved uh, because of a, a low score in the first instance. That was the only thing I was trying to address. But Tom, as, as our process, I mean, it, it will go through sort of a coaching phase with SEDCO first and then kind of before it even gets to the town council, right? So I think well, yep. types of, those types of messages certainly could be encouraged. I, I just think in their future, we're going to want to have a way that if we do say no to a particular application and yes to another, that we've got something to point at. So, it, we, you know, we're not looked at as being in any way sort of discriminatory or so I, sort of from those perspectives, but mm. certainly open to what others think. I just point of clarity though, for I think the chair, um, this is on the agenda tonight to be approved, I think. So if we, isn't it? Yeah, Peter, I think we're just doing the public hearing tonight and then we're gonna do the, we're gonna vote on it in a week, uh, two weeks, I think. Let me double check. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's just public hearing. I'm sorry. Okay. So yeah. We're just doing the public hearing tonight. Yep. Great. Yep. So, okay. I thought we we're trying to go from here. Okay. Great. Councilor, Councilor Johnson. Yeah. The scoring is tough, but I, I get, you got to start somewhere. I was just wondering, did you happen to push any of the recent uh, CEAs through this model? See how it felt? Cause that would be interesting to do. We just did Jocelyn and we did, you know, pretty painful wax. So, I would think we should be able to push those through this model for scoring. You agree? Maybe of interest might see if something breaks. Yeah. Because they were both approved. Yeah, I think the WEX one would be the one we'd use because that's an economic development tip. Or CEA, rather. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> I had another question because, like Council Gleistein said, a part of, part of this also is to get the council involved a little earlier than <laughs> prior engagements. So I've read this a couple of times, like great work, good document, but I still can't definitively determine when the council gets involved. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is Jocelyn's very fresh in my mind. My bad not knowing about Jocelyn, nobody else, just me. However, in light of workshops and watching videos of the planning board, these guys are so busy. But Jocelyn went through that whole process, used up all those resources before it came to the council. And the council can easily just say no, for whatever reason, didn't like the project, economic, you know, economic times are not right. And then all those resources, all that time had been used for early for nothing. So I, I kind of anticipated seeing in this a lot earlier entry of the council. Not necessarily a vote, but uh, an earlier entry into the council. And yeah. I just I can't find it. Yeah, I can direct your attention. It's in section three, step two. So it's uh, fairly early in the process. And uh, the end of step two, if an application is determined viable, the town manager shall notify the town council that an application is forthcoming. So, yeah, 
And what is it done? You said Appendix C? No, it's in uh, Section 3. How about a page? Give me a page. Well, I don't. One, two, three. Look for step two. Okay. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, yep. So this so is after SEDCO and the town manager reviews for viability. Correct. And, and, I, and I'm also uh, pulling in input from my staff. Okay. So again, I would just didn't want to beat this to death, but then looking at this, I mean, we've already done code enforcement, public works and all that, all that work has already been done before it comes before the council is made aware of this. There's a lot of work goes on in there. Is that not correct? Uh, potentially. Okay. Come on. I wasn't going to challenge it. I was, yep. My uh, my expectations were a little different. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Ken. I, you know, I, I would like to see, you know, if there's an application, the council's at least notified. I think um, even with Jocelyn, you know, we didn't have the details, but I think, yeah, and maybe this was not a great example, but it, at some point, some months earlier, you know, Chairman Johnson had said, hey, by the way, there's going to be, you know, this project's happening. So, um yeah, I think there's a step that at least the council could be notified that the town has been approached about a CEA. Right. Yeah, and, and to follow that up, in, a, in the perfect world, right, we are notified, that's fine. A lot of other people have got a lot of other things to do that are their purview. But it then would be great to be get a tickle email to go, hey, this is up in front of the planning board on the state, or this is over here being reviewed by this. At least to give the option for the for the councilors to jump in on that. So, but, but that's the perfect world. Uh, Councilor Johnson, this is an issue I struggle with all the time. I, I, your time is valuable. I also don't want to engage you until we have sufficient detail that you can actually, uh, you know, make some sense of of the matter yep. before you. And so, I think things do need to mature a bit before it goes to council. And I don't say that to keep it from you. I say that to uh, bring yep. you in at the appropriate juncture. And frankly, whether it's me or anyone else sitting in my chair would be a damn fool to, to advance these things without the knowledge of at least council leadership. Um, right. So uh, whether it's stated in this policy or not, I think there are other ways to make sure there's general awareness that we're working on something. Okay, but I, I would think the exception to that would be something like Jocelyn Place, because that was contingent on a CEA approval by the town council, right? I'm not sure if that, I, I don't follow your question, that that would be the exception. I'll step back and give it some thought. Thanks, thanks for the okay. input on that. Councilor Johnson, I mean, if, if you, as you look at the steps, where is there a place you would, or a process you would want to insert somewhere in that? Uh, not right off the top, Peter, I, you know, and then I thought, this being a workshop, I would hear other people's uh, thoughts, see if anybody else thought the same thing, and then maybe drill through it. So, just <clears throat> out of curiosity, yeah, I'd just like to hear from others with what they thought about it. Jai, Council Kulich, can you see your hand up? Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about this uh, somewhat during our yeah. finance committee meetings, and the concern, uh, Councilor Johnson, was that we didn't want to open the floodgates, right? And we don't want everybody to feel like they have an entitlement to a CEA from us. We thought that having at least a little bit of the pre-work done by the town manager with some discretion um, to say, hey, you know what, <laughs> this isn't worth our time, or you know what, maybe, and then he bounces it off leadership. And if it's something it looks like there's actually going to be an application, then that's the trigger, that um, that's the notification that uh, then the council would be kind of engaged. Uh, I think some of that pre-work is healthy to happen uh, below the radar and that's not necessarily below the radar but it's um that's the way it works somebody's going to call up um you know karen at sedco and, and say hey i got this project i need some help is there you know anything available and she'll kind of explain it to them and they'll bounce around the project a little bit and um if it looks like it's worth everybody's effort then they notify us is kind of the way i'm reading it and i i think it's i think i'm okay with that with that piece of it Councilor Katarina. 
Uh, yeah, and pardon me for not, well, anyway, affordable housing. Affordable housing, do they require, require the CEAs or is it just the affordable housing TIFs? Someone remind me. So if you want a CEA for affordable housing, you have to have a TIF. So mostly right. they go hand in hand. Right. So you request an affordable housing TIF right. because you want a CEA. Ours right. is a little bit different. Right. Yeah, the South Portland Housing Authority said they'd never done one in an economic development TIF, which started off kind of confusing, at least to some of us. Um, and so I think if there's another affordable housing project come forward, it's highly likely that they will, it'll be a TIF. And then they only need a TIF if they want a CEA, if that makes right. sense. Well, the, and the reason I'm asking it, the only reason I'm asking it is, um, has the affordable housing group in town, um, our affordable housing committee looked at this, that's all. And is there anything in the scoring that needs to happen in case we do have something that has to do with affordable housing? That's, that's the only reason I ask. I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I think Tom, you know, mentioned, and again, we struggle with this language. I'll be honest with you, you know, to say that, that, you know, this only applies to economic development TIFs and CEAs. You know, I think we felt that there, the steps and things like that could apply to the other things. So, you know, the answer, Jean Marie, might be to go ahead and flesh this out into an affordable housing TIF. Because do I think that the the the, the scores and the points is different? It's different questions. Absolutely, it's not the same questions. So, I think you know, the steps and how those things go forward and the transparency could apply to that. And then whether or not we grant one, you know, I think would look different, you know, what, what we asked for. So that's, that's my take on it. But I think it'll work for a little while to get the transparency, the steps, some answers to the questions. But, you know, um, I think sooner rather than later, we, we, we do well to, to work on that other one. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thanks. Castle Hill. <clears throat> a couple of comments about that. I mean, I do remember that, you know, the, the whole issue was really to, you know, get something in place. But I think that what has been done here has really gone quite, quite beyond just a, you know, a really basic policy. It's, uh, it's actually got you know, some aspects that are, you know, pretty, pretty detailed and pretty specific. I think it accomplishes very broadly uh, the couple of big concerns, you know, making sure it gets on the radar screen of the council, you know, sooner uh, rather than later, and also making sure that we don't burn up too much staff time, energy, and money. Uh, well, that's addressed by the fees. Um, and uh, another thing we haven't really talked about, but I, you know, a couple of people touched on it, you know, uh, having a, you know, for, for large CEAs, for one's five million or more, uh, you know, we're going to try to get some outside help on it. So I think that, you know, it, it accomplishes those basic questions. I think we're there in the first place, number one, but number two, you know, goes really quite, you know, quite a ways beyond that. So, you know, I, uh, you know, it answers more questions for me than it raises. Hey, Karen Martin. Sure. Just a, just a couple of things. Um, I just want to make sure, since the, my board is, is going to be involved in this, we just had a couple of questions, too. Um, and starting with uh, under rules and conditions, under tax increment financing, um, number one, there are a couple of places where it probably should be CEA versus TIF, but those are all um, separate from substance here. But I wasn't sure that we understood the difference between bullet one and bullet two. So I just wanted to ask that. And then we have a, another question with regard to the steps. So they, to me, bullet one and bullet two are, are saying the same thing. So I think I'm missing something in the translation. So we just wanna make sure we understand. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. I, they're certainly closely related. Um, you know, the second one refers to the public benefit, yeah. uh, it, whereas the first one really re refers to uh, 
projects that we would likely or might do by you know by ourselves through a general fund or capital uh, budget. Okay, the, it's just a little bit awkward, and I wasn't sure of that that extra phrase of but did not do so. We weren't quite sure what that meant. Whether there was something that we were missing in that. Oh. No, I, I mean, if the intention is just that it's going to be, you know, this is a, a normal public infrastructure project that's under the town's uh, purview. That was the intent, but okay. yeah, that language, but not did so simply means that we, though it's a project that we might or, or wish to fund, but we haven't. Yeah. Okay. It is a little okay. awkward. <laughs> just wanted to make sure there wasn't something um, yeah. that we weren't understanding. And then the other question we had uh, was really about um, when there is a there there's discussion of in step six of forming a negotiating team to include a town council member. It feels that that's really late in the process um, because we've done a you know step four and five really talk about preliminary terms and things like that. It just feels like we're defining a lot of uh, material about the terms and then the negotiating team is appointed in step six. So that may need to be moved up a bit or there should be a council liaison point person in the TIF process. Uh, so just a, just pointing out, we can put that up, up earlier. To step away for five minutes. I apologize. I'll be back. What others think about that? I mean, I think <clears throat> I think it's similar. The rationale was kind of similar to the others that to kind of let the process run through and finally gets to the final sort of negotiation phase. That's when a, a representative from the council would be there. Do others feel that a town council member should participate much earlier? Yeah, I, I, I go on this. I mean, I, I if I just use Wex as an example, I mean, we can get involved in that. Um, but I think we probably could have gotten involved in it sooner as a council, you know, uh, and as a, a couple of members of council. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I realize that this is a balance because you want to allow enough time for the, the seed to germinate here before you get a lot of people uh, hovering over it. Um, but if just error i think it'd be best to do that uh you know on uh on the front end over you know over notifying it, you know or involving and then stepping back if need be rather than we we're rushing and i felt in both of those we, we were playing catch up wex as well as uh jocelyn you know for for different reasons you know i don't you know again i don't know that this you know the policy will prevent that from ever happening again but it might it might be less of a chance of that your hand. Yeah, I, I think the distinction here, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Karen, is that, you know, an applicant, I think, has a right to ask for what they want to ask for. And it could present some problems if it's uh, materially different uh, than what we're willing to do. But I think that's the distinction is trying to be drawn here. The applicant can come forward, the modeling is done based on what the applicant's asking for. Hopefully staff has been able to help um, interject some input uh, in the early phases. Um, but then at some point that the council before it comes to the council in, you know, formally um, would sit down and negotiate the final terms. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure in step five, for instance, you've got revise and renegotiate with the applicant as necessary. So And then in step six, we're now renegotiating again. So I wasn't sure whether or not, uh, maybe it, it could just be moved up to step five. I think it's worth looking at before we vote on the final, mm -hmm. like looking at those, the timing of that. That's, okay. I agree with um, Karen and Don on that. Okay. And uh, I guess one more just uh, suggestion or question. Um, in the document, we talk about the uh, 
uh, application fee or the retainer, if we will. And then the, the discussion is if we, or the policy says, if we're not going to use that, then the retainer gets, re, um, re, whatever portion we don't use is refunded to the applicant at the conclusion of the project. So that could be 30 years down the way, if, depending on how you define project. So my suggestion might be um, once a application is approved and a CEA is signed, if the retainer was for the review of the project, it could get returned at that point. It says when the construction project is completed. So that's not at all the entire CEA term. Depends um, if it's if it's a phased project. Like, what point would you consider? Like, if if um, um, something that's a ten year project to be built out over time with that's different phases. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think it's the distinction um, if the if the funding was reserved for, you know, like um, the fact that they were going to finish the project or something else. This fund is specifically for the review process. Karen, so what if about you're done with the review process? Yeah, what about it at the council vote? Yeah, or it's signing. The money could be refunded yeah. or, right. you know, I, I don't know. That's just a thought off the top of my head. Yeah. I'm not married to that. Right. I would say, sign. you know, at, at the signing of the, when both parties have signed. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, because by then it's gone through legal again, and yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yep. It's worth it's definitely worth thinking about that for the final. Any other any other counselor comments or questions? Because yep, yeah, that's good. Sorry, was it me? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, you know, I just want to say I, I I've been hot and cold on this. Um, because we're taking something that's by its nature very non-standard and trying to standardize it. And um, I, I, I will say that I, I think it does a pretty good job of creating some transparency in terms of this is how it comes to the table, right? And it, it gives some discretion to the town manager to kind of work the process before it gets too far. Um, so I, I kind of, I like the stepped process. I think getting um, SEDCO and the town council together um, to have a discussion about the project before it gets too, too far is probably a good idea. Um, some of the, you know, with the, the scoring, I, I, I'm more cold on um, because I, I think it assumes or presumes that you have perfect foresight and it, it's hard to anticipate what you might be judging a future project on. You know, the, the times are dynamic, they change. So, um, so I'm less in love with that, but all in all, I, I think, um, in terms of creating some vision into the, the process of how these things come to be, I think it does a pretty good job of that. So, and I, I know it was a, a long haul to get there. <laughs> Castle Hamill? Yeah, this is, um, you know, a little bit of a build on, uh, you know, John's point there, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering, um, you know, what, how, if this is a policy, how does it, how does it get memorialized? Does it become an ordinance or was it a policy, something that's, uh, you know, uh, a guideline that's not as enforceable. It's a gov governance question. Well, you, you mean, I'll, I'll take a study. Don, you know, as a policy, it really was meant to be kind of just a guide, a guidepost to how to kind of bring some structure and process has just been outlined to the process. Not sure we wanted something as binding as an ordinance, which then restricts some of the, the flexibility. So I think we kind of look at this, this was kind of a work in progress. It really was trying to address the need. We really didn't have any structure about how to approach this and evaluate. I think as, as Coach Kluchier said, it kind of at least starts a process that we can modify as we go forward and we learn more and maybe at some point codify. But I think when we initially took it on, I, I didn't think that the, the goal was really an ordinance. It was more of, of sort of where we've landed, but, but certainly open to, you know, others, other views. Great. Thanks. Thank you. 
Councilor Paul Johnson, Chair? Yeah, I view this as, yeah, this is a town council policy, right? It's not an ordinance that, it's not a town-wide ordinance, so to speak, but it's one of our policies that we operate under. Um, so that, I guess that would be my take on Don's question. And then it's a little nitpicky, but if there's a way to, I actually, the scoring exercise, I agree with uh, Councillor Clucci, but I also think it's a good exercise, right? So it's something, it's, it, you know, we're always looking for stuff to just, you know, for tops of conversation and try to, as Betsy said, try to quantify something that's subjective. So something nitpicky is maybe we drop the word criteria and just call it something else, right? Because it's not, I mean, I mean, what I'm hearing repeatedly is that it's not really the criteria. We just want to go through that exercise. Um, I don't know. A criteria would suggest that we're we're going to measure it against a benchmark and say yes or no to it. So I guess you know it's something silly, but that might help John and Don and myself's thoughts of you know it's more of an exercise than as a criteria. I, I think it's worthwhile doing, but I'm with John in the sense where I it, it's more of an exercise than than something I would be willing to make a complete decision on. Is, I guess we, which I think we all have clearly stated we wouldn't make a complete decision based off this exercise. So. Those would be my thoughts with scoring. Right, like I said, it started off with just questions and they have to answer the questions anyway. It's it's just, you know, how well are they meeting that? I, I personally, you know, think that this is some, I think over time you'd, you'd probably adjust them, change them, add to them maybe if, if it comes up that much. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, something else you said, Paul. I think in terms of policy versus ordinance, Don, my personal opinion is when you work on things like this, you definitely make them a policy first and you use them and see what happens. Now, I guess we're being pretty optimistic here, thinking we're going to be getting all these economic development requests, but hey, let's hope, let's hope so. Um, and then... Uh, you know, from there, you could make it a policy, I mean, an ordinance, um, once you've kind of fleshed it out, or you could take some part of it, you know, that at that point, you know, if the residents came forward and said, no, you know, if it's more than $10 million, we say no, we want that as an ordinance. So there could be pieces of it, in my opinion. But it's certainly where you, the previous finance committee started it was to get something in place. And I think that that's really important. And I think one of the reasons that hasn't been mentioned tonight of why that's important, as well as some type of a, you know, we don't want to call it a scoring, but, you know, as well as some type of an objective way to look at things that are um, important to the values of the town, so that we have a document that we can go back and fill in step one, this occurred on this date, step two, this is who was involved, we will have a documentation tool. So if a council changes over, or a finance committee changes over, or residents want to see what we did, we've got the steps in place. It's not just, well, these guys are getting favoritism. These guys don't get favoritism. No, people went through the similar process. These are the dates that it happened. You know, these are, you know, who was involved. This is what was discussed. It was the meeting related to step four that occurred. Um, right now, I think the ones that we did, you know, were largely driven by PowerPoints. And I'm government by PowerPoint, quite frankly, drives me personally crazy because it's really hard to go back and figure everything out. The PowerPoints are hugely helpful, but I think a framework around the presentations and the PowerPoint is really helpful. Sorry, I'm gonna mute because that's my other line. Yeah. So as we kind of wind down the hour, uh, Chair Johnson, is there, are there any, anybody queued up that wanted to speak from the audience? Oh, that's a good question. Let me check. Uh, does anybody in the audience like to speak? There's three people in the audience. <laughs> One of them's Liam. I'm going to assume he doesn't want to speak. So, nope. Well, I think we're good there, Peter. So, so then, I, as we sort of, yeah, Tom. Could I just make a quick point, uh, just to tag on that the, the final conversation, uh, policy as opposed to ordinance. I strongly encourage you to keep it as a policy and thereby have some flexibility. We can't possibly envision. Uh, all of the possible things that may come your way. And I think it'd be tragic for you to, to, be, uh, to, to be bound by uh, an ordinance and not be able to do something that you'd want to do otherwise. So I think a policy gives you the flexibility. What it also does is it tells the public that we've got a, a process and we're gonna be, here's the steps and you can follow along if you like. It tells the development community, this is what's expected of you. And I think that sort of predictability and consistency is huge. It also says this council 
uh, is really suggesting to future councils um, that this is a, a this is a good practice. They may choose to have different priorities in Appendix C in their scoring system, but I think it's a, a good practice for you to indicate to future councils uh, that this is a good. Uh, it's good to have a process, whatever that might be. So I think I think there's a number of key points served by this, uh, but I do encourage you to keep it as a policy. So some really quick, oh, Council Johnson. Yeah. Sorry, because you were doing a great job of wrapping it up. I'll blame that on Tom. Um, but one thing we might want to add in here is just um, that an electronic file stored in a commonly accessible area is created for each one of these steps. Because I think one of our, to Betsy's points is, we, I think we have a continued frustration of, man, I'd like to click a button and just see the chronology of WEX or see the chronology of, or, of the downs or what have you. So maybe part of this policy is that it needs to be put in one place that's accessible to, to all parties involved. Because um, if we're gonna if we're gonna really tie this to a step process and be able to go back and look at it, I'd love to be able to have that. Then, then six months down the road, have to keep emailing the town manager and say, hey, give me this, give me this, give me this, right? So I think, we can improve on it that way. So that's my final comment, apologies. So, so some real quick, just housekeeping items before we close, circling back everybody's conversation. One, I don't think we closed out or just kind of show of not of heads of ever. Tom made a suggestion to increase or in, include wording said that there's no minimum score. Do you think that's a good addition for the next round or are we good with the current wording? Any reaction either way? Uh, okay, <laughs> not seeing any reaction. I, I thought that um, Paul's suggestion would have covered that same thing as well. If you remove the criteria. Oh, okay. So that so another question I had: if we remove the criteria and said something like decision making guide, credit enhancement agreement, decision making guide, does that read better? Everybody's comfortable with that. Okay, so that was great suggestion. So wording we got notification. Councillor Ken Johnson, I think you were you're thinking about that. Didn't know if you were comfortable, if everybody's comfortable the way it is, or not seeing much reaction. So, Councillor Ken Johnson, I think you said you wanted to kind of just have some time. So, there'll be some time to let us know. Um, we're we're good. We're good. Third thing that was suggested that. Third thing that was suggested to see if folks, the, the suggestion was made that maybe we should run a test case through the scoring matrix. And I think Tom suggested we should take a look at, Tom, what did you suggest? You suggested WEX, right? That's the, yeah, that's the most recent one that would apply. Um, folks think that that's a good exercise? Yeah. I see, see some head nodding. Um, then I think um, Karen Martin suggested from SEDCO that we move up to step five, the town council individual involvement. And I thought saw some head nodding around that. Is that generally okay? It was just getting the town council member involved a little earlier in, right. the, in the process. Yep. Okay, that looks good. Um, I have a comment on that one actually, maybe at if this is a negotiation team, maybe that it's linked to appointments and negotiations somehow so that there's a standing council member that's involved with that type of work. I don't know that it needs to be, because where would we meet, or would the chair appoint it maybe? I, I guess, I'm trying to follow through how that would happen. Yeah, I think at one point we thought it may be someone on the finance committee, so I'm not sure. It, it probably makes sense to maybe designate where. Well, you know, I think, I personally would leave it open because things come up sometimes that different counselors have some sort of a, an affinity for, or, you know, you know, okay. it, it could be something that, you know, somebody's say it's something with the tourist industry, John, we might say, well, you know, John's got a lot of experience on that and he's got a lot of knowledge, but he's not on this particular committee. I, you know, I think it, uh, it pushes itself out a lot, but that's just my, that's just my opinion. I'm a strong, I'm a strong second of what Betsy just said. I think you utilize the strengths and interests of the current council members. And time capacity. You know, one of you might be able to devote time right. and others can't. Time okay. and, in, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you so, trying? The, so those changes we just sort of went through are then folks comfortable with where we are? Karen had that one to kind of combine those two bullet points that were almost the same. Did Tom? Yeah. Think we should do that or 
yeah, I, I can find a way to combine those two. Okay. And then I think the only other thing, and I'd have to go back through it, but I think Karen mentioned that maybe we still use TIF when we should have used CEA. I do think that's worth going back through that. And you know, Karen, if you, have, if you have one, you know, if you have something, you know, one specifically where you think we should change it, I think getting that straight is very important. So I'll coordinate with Karen on that. I caught a, a couple of those as well. So okay, yeah. we can provide you a straight through and underlined version that will show the changes from tonight. Um, so you'll see them very clearly. The other one that Karen mentioned was just further clarity on the application fee in the event that we have excess funds. Oh yes, the yes. Yep. I think she's probably right. It's clear to tie it to the CEA approval yep. because that retainer is, it, there's no need to expend any additional funds once the CEA is approved, right? Right. Everybody agree? Yeah, Everybody I would say that the, yeah, the legal agreement signed, but we usually have the legal agreement prior to the vote because we know what's going to be in the legal agreement. So it's six of one, half a dozen of another. But yeah, I think the approval. Yeah. All right, good. We'll, we'll make that change and you'll see it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It, it, it'll eventually come out of committee at some point, I'm hoping. <laughs> I think I think we're still going to vote on it in two weeks without I mean these I mean if I'm mistaken not mistaken these are some pretty minor adjustments yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. so I, I'm not looking to change the date so the only thing I right. can't commit to uh, I'll do my best is to, to run the WEX through the model and see see what that result is but uh, I'll make every effort to do so well and, and Tom excuse me and then the other thing I think actually was Jean Marie's point which I don't think I addressed was getting at least a legal look at it see if there's anything yeah i can accomplish that contrary sure. to state yeah yep. mm -hmm. was there no appetite to put an, a requirement for a shared electronic folder in there oh no i think that's a good I, one yeah that's yeah good point yeah that's fine. Okay. is that shared with the public uh, with the council I just want to be clear that's a good question i would i'd probably say council and uh, administrative task and said co to be to be let's say uh, available to the public as soon as council sees it for the first time, or maybe pin it to yeah. pin it to like our, the first time that we workshop it or something, if that makes sense. Yeah. So step, uh, whatever that joint workshop between SEDCO and the town council is, we can pin it to that and say, make it public at, at that time. That works. Is that, is that step, step two? Is that step two? No, step uh, step four. So at that time, it'll be made available to the public. Hey, Paul, really quickly, are we staying on this? Yeah, nothing's changing. Yep, thanks for asking. Yep. I just did it last time because there was about 30 people in that first workshop. So. <laughs> okay, so I guess with that, I think our workshop's concluded and we'll in what, four minutes, move to the town council meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. into okay this is the one could someone kick me off
Paul, can you kick me out? I sure can. Get out of here. Tom, before I get started, did you did should I read Phil's um, opinion before the public hearing or before our action? Just because there's two different agenda items. Uh, action, I think, is where it's most appropriate. Yeah, me too. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. This is the Wednesday, October twenty first, twenty twenty, town council uh, regular town council meeting of Scarborough, Maine. I will call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And item number three is roll call, Tom. Councilor Clucci. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Gleistein. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here. Item number four is general public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Is there any comments from members of the public for items that are not on the agenda? Okay. Item number six is approval of the minutes from the October 7th, 2020 town council meeting. Do I have a so motion? So nope. moved. Second. Discussion? Tom? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Item number six is adjustment to the agenda, and we don't have any adjustments to the agenda tonight, Mr. Hamill. <laughs> True. Item number seven is uh, treasurer's warrants. I signed those, I believe, last week. Uh, item number eight is the town manager's report. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple points of interest. I, I sound like a broken record, but I want to give you an update on uh, the voting activity. It's, uh, I think, front and center on a lot of people's minds, certainly us here at Town Hall. Uh, just to give you a quick update, as of 4 p.m. this afternoon, we had issued uh, 10,575 ballots uh, to, to voters, and we've accepted and processed back 8,206 of them. So there's still another 2,300 or so uh, out in the community. I know we've been in touch with the postmaster. There's a number of folks that have requested ballots. We have sent them, and they have not been received yet. So. I, I don't think we can't provide a definitive answer as to why that's the case. Um, I will say though, starting October 26th, we can and will start issuing duplicate ballots for folks that, um, that wish to have them. We do expect that that might be a very brisk day and, or two with folks uh, requesting duplicate ballots. So we'll be staffing accordingly uh, to, to handle any of the unexpected or expected rush. Uh, we've also chosen to extend voting hours uh, to include this Saturday morning, and that will be from 8 a.m. to noon here at Town Hall. Uh, this evening, we had our late hours till 6 p.m. Um, just observing, we had very few coming through, but uh, we thought it was good to expand those hours Saturday morning, so we've made those arrangements. And the last thing, uh, Toadie's made arrangements to begin processing of absentee ballots we actually have up to seven days before the election to do it. Based on our experience back in July, uh, she thinks she only needs two days. So uh, October 30th and the 31st, we'll have uh, six, uh, six, six teams of two, I believe, uh, processing those ballots. And she's quite sure she can get through. If she can't, we always have Monday the following week to do that work. Uh, obviously, we'd like to get all of the early votes, The uh, absentee ballots process before election day. 
and that's our goal and I'm sure we can do it. Um, again, my prediction, I think we're on track for maybe as high as a 75% voter turnout, uh, the way we're working at this point. A lot depends on election day. Uh, so uh, time will tell. Um, similarly, another update on childcare. Uh, we are really kind of hitting our groove, so to speak. Still, we are challenged getting part-time staff. We did hire one who's working out terrifically well. Full-time staff is stepping up tremendously, uh, really showing the range of their creativity and skill set. And uh, we're really getting a, a lot of good feedback from uh, participants and parents. Uh, we do have some extra uh, additional room and capacity. We do have some students starting in November. Um, their you know, family situations uh, dictated that they didn't need the care until November. So uh, that coupled with some additional open houses and some marketing efforts uh, that will be rolling out over the next week or so, we're hopeful to get up to the maximum numbers. But uh, I can report that things are going very well. Uh, on the COVID front, I'm pleased to report um, the little issues that we had, I say little, in hindsight they were, but um, in the, both the police and fire department have been, were isolated to the staff that I previously reported to you. There was no spread beyond. Um, also pleased to report that all folks that had been quarantined as part of that event are now back at work and functioning fine. So I really feel as though we've dodged a bullet. It was a huge reminder to us um, that we need to just redouble our efforts, uh, not doing anything different, but just uh, doing what we all have, um, you know, should be doing, frankly. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be offering some similar comments uh, through a leader article to the community, just uh, encouraging vigilance as we enter the uh, holiday season and uh, you know, have the tendency of, of gathering even with family members, uh, there needs to be some precautions taken. So. Uh, Maine continues to do quite well comparatively to a lot of the others, almost all other states. Uh, but there's some frightening warning signs on the horizon um, in our country. So I hope that everyone is heeding that warning and going to be doing everything they can to protect themselves and, and their friends and family. Um, we are, have entered the so-called stage four of the governor's reopening of Maine's economy. And that really pertains predominantly to the restaurant and, and the bar industry. Um, that coupled with the council's recent action to extend your flexibility for outdoor seating, um, we hope will be um, effective in our local economy and allowing some, some restaurants and establishments to, to stay open. I'm not sure if they'll all take advantage of it. I think it's really a case by case basis. And I know Karen and Others on staff are assisting businesses uh, as we speak in kind of that evaluation. But I think it was really important for the council to have taken that step and, and uh, in doing so provide the flexibility to businesses uh, who, who want to do it. And Karen through SEDCO uh, is doing some good publicity around round two of the economic recovery grants that are just being released. Uh, so uh, I credit her with, with really doing uh, a lot in the business community and this is just the most recent example of that. Um, I wanted to foreshadow an issue that I expect will be before the council at your next meeting. You may recall during the budget discussions, uh, one of the uh, capital projects the school brought forward was the construction of a school uh, storage building. And that was really to enable uh, space that they're currently um, using within the walls of the high school uh, to make it into classroom space. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, Scarborough has been awarded now two rounds of COVID relief funding. And in the second round, uh, they did put it in a request to fund uh, a building, a similar building. And they just found out Friday last week that that was funded. Uh, the catch with all of this is that the monies need to be expended. And in this case, the building opened and operational by the end of December. So there's an extremely tight timeline. The issue that comes to council uh, in front of council is that their proposal is to place it on the uh, the old water tank site, which is uh, proximate to the high school, and it's uh, technically a town-owned property. And so uh, I think they do need council approval to do so. And at this point, I've discussed it briefly with uh, town council leadership. We'll talk about it in more detail, but I, I want to just to flag the issue. Um, there's a lot of work for them to get done, including 
going to planning board for an advisory board uh, uh, advisory opinion. So um, at this point, it's not certain that they're able to accomplish all of this in the short time frame. but I wanted just to alert you to the possibility that you'll be talking about it and considering uh, some action at your next meeting. And the last thing I'll just mention and highlight is our ad hoc committee solicitation process. We're still open and underway. Uh, I think we need to probably do a little refresher with social media. It's been a little stagnant over the last week or so, but we do have 17 folks uh, for the downtown committee and eight for charter at this point. And uh, that will remain open through uh, next Friday, the 6th. Uh, we're on a schedule to have council to meet and consider kind of do the selection on the 11th of November uh, with hopefully appointments coming at uh, the November 18 meeting. So these committees could be fully functioning starting in December, presumably. So Tom, ne next Friday is not the 6th, so there's a little more time then. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you know that deadline is not hard and fast. We're just trying to have a, a timeline uh, to bring this through through council. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm quite sure that what is a certain date is November 11th. So we'd have to have it the week prior to that, whatever okay. that date Yeah, is. no, I just said, you said ne next Friday, next Friday would be like the 30th. So I think we, folks have got a couple of weeks there. I beg your pardon, correct. Okay, yep. yeah, that's, that's, that was my only question. Yep, no, you're, you're exactly right. I guess I'm- And, uh, and, and November 11th, is Veterans Day? We can talk about this would be a special meeting of council. So that's just uh, a date on the calendar leadership team has put together. I think yeah. that there's flexibility there. I uh, just wanted to throw that out since, you know, it's a sure. town, town hall is closed and whatever. So it's envisioned to be a, uh, an executive session of the council. So you can have a open and candid conversation uh, about the candidates. So I think we have flexibility as to when you have that. Good point. And we could do it remotely. So under the current rules. So. And although I think we discussed, it's probably more practical to do it in Tom's room because then last time it worked quite well to, well, that's right, Gene, we'll figure it out. Let's, let's deal with this on a, on a different basis. So <laughs> point, point being is uh, I'm pleased we're up and running. I'd love to get these committees staffed with, uh, with their uh, citizen appointments so we can undertake the work. Thank you. Hey, Tom, a uh, quick question. Can you just, um, just because when you say the word duplicate ballot, I'm sure that some people's hair goes up on the back of their neck. So can you please walk us through the audit process and why a duplicate ballot, ballot apps under no uncertain terms means somebody's voting twice, just so everybody can be clear? I'm really, I'm not the authority here and I'll, I'll certainly have Tody speak to it, but I assure you there are uh, very strict procedures um, that includes the 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 voter uh, uh, you know, providing a, a reason for needing a duplicate battle a ballot. Uh, in this case, I think the majority of those reasons will be that I've requested and have not received it. Um, the system is smart enough to know that if you know once a ballot is cast, a, a second one cannot be cast. They're and, putting their name and address on the envelope and signing it and sealing it. Oh yes, yes, okay. oh yes, and and believe me, we catalog everyone that comes back in, so we know the date we receive it. Um, there are uh, daily audits that occur here. Staff is held probably an hour and a half after office hours close, uh, doing those daily audits to make sure that the system reflects all ballots uh, received on that day. And they're cross, they're literally looking at each envelope, looking at the address written on each envelope and cross-referencing it with who has checked in to vote earlier that day. That's correct. And so if someone uh, you know does that and then chooses to show up on election day and try to vote again, the election workers have up-to-date uh, roles and they will know that they've already um, submitted their ballot uh, by absentee. Thanks. I just okay. wanted to spell it out a little bit, so. Sure, and Councilor Johnson, I believe you taped a video that uh, went into some um, uh, highlights on, on voting procedure. No, mine was more of a hype video just to tell people to go and vote. So I, so yeah, so, so don't oversell it. <laughs> I, I guess the last thing for hopefully to give confidence uh, and comfort to the voters, our outside uh, drop box is being used uh, an incredible amount. I, I would say 75% of what we're getting back are going through that box. 
Uh, many folks feel the need uh, to hand deliver it. That's fine. We're here to assist them. We do have a permanent security system in place. And so, uh, you know, we have a good, good controls in place to make sure that that box is being monitored 24 seven. Thank you, sir. Any other quick questions for Tom before I move on? Councilor Katarina? Yeah, just real quick, that building that the school wants to do, are they looking to do a permanent structure or a temporary from a real estate point of view? I mean, are they looking to put it on a foundation or are they looking to get something that would be there for a while? I mean, but it's not permanent. No, they're, the propos they're proposing a slab foundation stick built uh, between 2,000 and 2,400 square feet fairly similar to the structure that they talked about at budget time. Okay. And, and the only reason I asked that is because, boy, I don't know, getting anything built between now and December 31st is like, uh, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, fair I hate point. to say that unless, unless the Volk school or SMCC or they can get it and that, you know, from those programs. I believe they've so, already been in touch with local contractors. Okay. So uh, your point's well taken. It's going to be yeah. very, very difficult to, to yeah. accomplish. Yeah. Councilor Gucci? Tom, along the, the same lines, uh, you know, is this part of the master plan for the campus or is it, is, what kind of review other than an advisory and opinion from the planning board would this go through? Is there anything that we need to be concerned about? The, the documents that are relevant, uh, we do have a master campus plan that I can share with you, I will. Uh, it did indicate what it did uh, is, is looked at all available and currently undeveloped land on this campus. And then it matched it up with uh, at least that uh, known facility needs at that point. This, this structure was not part of that analysis, the long range facility plan. The only one, the only uh, potential need that that site was identified uh, to, to suit would be potentially relocating the tennis courts. Uh, its size and configuration and location really don't lend itself well um, to much other use, frankly. So uh, my quick response is I don't think we're, um, we're, we're necessarily going to be harming ourselves uh, in terms of uh, uh, not being able to do other things on that site. I just don't think there are many other opportunities there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to order number 2092. Before I do, if you're in the public, uh, just as a heads up, we do have a public hearing on several marijuana licenses, and then, we're, then we will be making a decision on four marijuana licenses separately. So if you are here for the public hearing, I suggest you also hang out for the discussion on the licenses that we're actually acting on. Uh, so first, this is a public hearing only, which is order number 2092. It's a 7 p.m. public hearing on the new request for the following marijuana establishment licenses and schedule final approval for Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. Number one is Maine Holdings LLC located at 10 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Number two is Calico Cannabis LLC located at 10 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Number three is Grove Street, uh, Grove Street Farms located at 10 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Number four, Four is Shauna Ray uh, Tomlinson, located at 20 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Number five is Absolute Healing, located at 20 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Number six is High Seas Provisions, located at 20 Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. And number seven is Main Lab LLC, located at 71 Pleasant Hill Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Again, this part of it is a public hearing for these seven. And with that, I have, um, I also have a couple I will read into the record as soon as everybody is done speaking. Uh, Liam Gallagher has raised his hand. So Liam, I'm just gonna, you wanna come in? I guess I'll promote you. Come on in, Liam. Yeah, Paul, just briefly, I just wanted to make one quick edit. The um... The main lab license is actually a, a medical manufacturing, proposed ma medical manufacturing license. So okay, just perfect. I apologize. Thank you. That's all for me for now. Thank you. Uh, again, I have a couple of emails I'll be reading into the public record, but before I do, is there anybody here that's with us today that would like to speak? Just raise your hand. 
And the way this works is I will unmute you, but I will keep your microphone off and you can speak. I mean, excuse me, I'll keep your camera off and unmute you. <laughs> okay, I will read my emails and then I'll circle back to anybody watching just in case. Bear with me, everybody. I need to find the emails. I have them in one place. Okay, here we go. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, sorry, I, I can't see the screen while I'm reading. I, letter number one, I'm writing in reference to the request for a marijuana establishment license put forth by the business at 10 and 20 Snow Canning Road in Scarborough. I spend much of my summer at my college in quote, Rest Point on 9 East Grand Avenue, which is just down the route, road from these businesses. I am very concerned by the smell that is already coming from the current marijuana facility there and would be opposed to any further establishments operating there. In addition, we have also seen an uptick in uh, vagrancy and crime in our small neighborhood this past summer and are concerned that there may be an increase if more applicants are granted a license to maintain marijuana establishments. Although I'm not able to attend this meeting in person, uh, I would like this read into the, the record for my disagreement of the proposal. That is uh, Mary Ellen Cahill. Letter number two, uh, we are writing in reference to the request for the marijuana established license put forth for businesses at 10 and 20 Snow Canning Road in Scarborough. Our community rest point is just down the road up from these businesses and we are very concerned by the smell that is already coming from the current marijuana facility uh, that would be there opposed to, and we'd be opposed to any further establishments operating there. Uh, and it goes on to say it's the same letter, but it's written by somebody else. So I'm going to keep continue reading it. In addition, we also see an uptick in vagrancy and crime in our neighborhood this past summer and are concerned that there uh, would be an increase if more applicants are granted a license to maintain this marijuana establishment. Please read this uh, disagreement into our public record. And this is for the entire board of the uh, Rest Point condo board. So that is not one resident, but is, that is several. Uh, I have one more here. We are writing today uh, to voice our opinion regarding the recent marijuana cultivation establishments in our neighborhood. We appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to have opinions heard by the council's decision on this matter. With that in mind, we are asking that order number 20085 listed on the October 21st agenda as old business for final approval be held, be held without a final vote until the establishment's doing business as Grove Street, Street Collective LLC, Snow Canning Road. Abutters were not previously notified re regarding Grove Street Collective LLC requests, so therefore they should not be included in the six identified companies at these two addresses. We've had a wonderful privilege of living at 10 Beckford Street, Scarborough, since February 2007. We have six adult children, 10 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. None of them live in Scarborough, but love coming home for, quote, home for family gatherings holidays and for numerous parties and events that were hosted at our home over the years. We live in a wonderful old family oriented neighborhood consisting of Bickford and Holly streets. Although our children are grown, we enjoy seeing the young families who have recently moved in with their small children. Holly street is especially buzzing with children riding bikes, skateboards, playing tag and roasting marshmallows. Every home on Holly street has one to four children under the age of 12. We know that Pine Point has long been considered a quote working waterfront part of town and is known for its hardworking fishing industry. That's what we love and why we purchased our home here. The sound of the ocean surf on a quiet evening, the healing scent of the salt air, the offshore breeze, and even the smell of the marsh at low tide. We've all even become accustomed to the occasional smells of fish, roe, and lobster packing from the old snow, Snow's cannery and other businesses. It smells like Maine. However, the smell of marijuana that permeates our neighborhood is so offensive, so disgusting, and so intolerable, it often keeps us inside with our windows shut. This is no way to live. Given the unique qualities of our neighborhood, the families who live here, especially those small children affected, not to mention the impacts of tourism and the environment, the marijuana cultivation business would be much better suited in an industrial setting, not a neighborhood setting. We ask the town council to please consider how the marijuana cultivation industry would impact their own neighborhoods, lifestyles, and property values if it was in their backyard and vote no to the seven independent applicants requesting licenses for snow canning road addresses. We thank you in advance for representing the voice of our constituents. Respectfully submitted David uh, Rabideau and Darlene Smith. And as usual, I apologize if I misspoke on any of that. Uh, we also did receive, uh, I believe it is three other emails in opposition of these licenses. They were not asked specifically to be read into the public record, so I am not. Um, typically, I read the ones that ask to be read into the public record. Uh, with that, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak?
There is not. So I will close the public hearing. We are now on to order 20093, which is a 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a final approval for Wednesday, November 4th, 2020 on the proposed TIF CEA policy as recommended by the Finance Committee. And this is a public hearing only, but I would encourage you if you're watching now, please rewind the video back to the very beginning. We just had a one hour workshop on this, um, on this specific policy. So this is a public hearing only. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak? Again, if you're watching the video, there's a workshop on this same video. Please feel free to go back and watch the hour of discussion and we will be voting. Uh, well, it'll actually be a one, one vote in two weeks on finalizing the policy. Okay, on to old business. Order number, and I, I apologize, I think one of the emails I read probably should have been read on this um, order, so I apologize. Order number 20085 is an act on the request for the final approval of a marijuana establishment license from the following establishments. ZGE Botanicals LLC located at 4 Commercial Road for an adult marijuana cultivation facility. Daily Provider LLC located at 4 Commercial Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Grove Street Collective LLC located at 10 Snow, Car Snow Canning Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. Darago Enterprises LLC located at 137 Pleasant Hill Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. So this is, um, we are acting on this. Before I take a motion, I'm gonna let Liam introduce these. And then I also have a quick email from our attorney, Phil Saucier, and then I will ask for a motion and we'll discuss. After the, if, I'll give the public an opportunity to speak after that as well, sorry. Go ahead, Liam. So uh, just to give a, the, the council a brief update, the, uh, the four licenses before you this evening essentially represent batch three of uh, what could be as many as five batches. I'm beginning to populate uh, applications for batch five. Um, to date, we've, uh, the council has approved 13 applications. Uh, so with these four, that bring the total up to 17 uh, licenses uh, to date. Um, all of the ones before you this evening have been vetted by staff and site inspections have been performed. Actually, some follow-up inspections uh, did occur in, in this batch, which is why it was so late in getting to the council, but they have been signed off on and we believe they're compliant with section five of the ordinance. Thank you. And before I ask for the members of the public, I'm just going to read a quick email from Phil. It says, I'm writing, today, I'm writing to briefly summarize our conversations regarding the marijuana establishment licensing ordinance. As an initial matter, an application must include all of the information required in section five of the ordinance, including evidence of a security plan, odor and mitigation plan, operations plan, and all the other enumerated submission criteria, as well as a required application fee. If an application is found to be complete by the town clerk, the town council must hold a public hearing. If the application is completed is complete and the police fire excuse me the police chief fire chief and code enforcement officer have all made the determination that the application the applicant complies with the local ordinance and state law the town council must approve the application if it meets the or if it meet if it meets the ordinance including the standards in section 10 an application should not be denied unless it does not meet one of the applic applicable standards if an applicant then violates the licenses, license or ordinance, the town council can suspend or revoke a license and could also be subject to penalties under sections nine and 11. Um, and that just came about, I had asked Tom to briefly, Tom and Liam to briefly talk to Phil about the order of um, essentially enforcement from approval to enforcement. Uh, so with that, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak? There's none, and I have no problem sharing. Oh, there is, sorry. Uh, David and Darlene, I'm going to allow you to speak. You're just gonna have to un unmute your microphone. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Can you hear us? We can hear you, yep. Great, okay. great. My concern is the specifically the Grove Street Collective LLC at 10 Snow Canning Road, which is um, order number 20-085, is gonna be um, addressed tonight. How many licenses are allowed at each individual address? 
And how is the council planning for future, um, if, there, if there is odor, like we've been getting all the time, how do you identify which one of these seven businesses are responsible for that? Thanks, Darlene. Uh, Liam, do you want to try to uh, address Darlene's question? Sure. So um, that the snow canning facilities, there's there's actually two addresses, um, and we've we've actually received 15 applications uh, for what are largely existing and what we understand to be existing cultivation operations. So, um, in having a conversation with the landlords of those properties. Um, they, they haven't seen an expansion of their cultivation space in, in almost three years. So while there has been some turnover of tenants, the actual space utilized in those facilities for the cultivation of marijuana has not expanded or increased during that period of time. To um, David and Darlene's specific question pertaining to how are we going to source uh, the odor from one of those 15 licenses, I think that's going to be a real challenge. Um, you know, to date, I think that's something that there's been quite a lot of conversation uh, with the council around the, the odor concerns, namely around those two addresses, those facilities. Uh, and we have engaged in conversations with the landlord and they are fully aware that that is going to be something that's going to be uh, a, a real significant discussion as we have our check-in again, uh, Chairman uh, Johnson's already outlined a, a check-in follow-up just after the first of the year with how these performance standards outlined in, in section 10 are, are being complied with successfully or not. Um, so I, I absolutely appreciate that that's gonna be a real challenge. I think that we'll likely have to engage in ongoing discussions with the landlord as opposed to each individual applicant uh, to, to get a handle on those concerns should they continue into the future. Thanks, Liam. Um, Darlene? This, uh, Darlene or David, did you have any other further public comment before I? Um, I think we're still on. Are we still on? I think. I yeah, can... you are. Sorry. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can... If that's okay. No, no, that's that's fine. Uh, I that's a very large concern of ours in our neighborhood. We've been um, we've been complaining quite a bit about the odor, um, and at, obviously, you know, we've been remiss and have missed ordinance type uh, zoning meetings. I don't even know why this type of business is allowed in uh, residential neighborhoods um, when there's industrial space available. Um, so shame on us as neighbors that we, yes, we've known it's been going on, but we thought all of you were there to protect this, us from this type of thing happening. So another question, uh, just to bring me up to, to speed, is there, an area in the town of Scarborough that you cannot have a medical cultivation license. Thanks, Darlene. I'm going to put you. I'm going to put you back in the audience, and I'm going to let Liam answer that, and then we'll we're going to we'll have our discussion. Point of information. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Point of information, really quick. Yep. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible to ask um, David and Darlene a, a question that have they? Is there something that's changed? Uh, recently in terms of the odor or is this an ongoing um, concern over the past you know several months or even years or is this new since the the new ordinance has passed so I'm addressing that to you I'm hoping to get it answered but yeah sure yeah I think that's a fair yes yeah so we'll bend the rules a little bit and David and Darlene is this do you feel like there's an uptick or is it more of an awareness because it's actually before us now I think, um, in my opinion, I think it's not has nothing to do with being before you. We've been complaining about it from the onset, and now it's even more profound. So that it kind of explains to me if there's 15 different licenses before the board or potentially coming before the board, that means there's probably much larger growth operation, even though the landlord is saying the square footage may be the same, it's my understanding that each growing company are allowed so many plants to cultivate. So possibly that's what we're smelling. Possibly it's the number or the activity, but it's been a good year, year and a half. I, my perspective is that it's been a solid year yeah. of near nightly um, 
occurrences. Yeah. Prior to that, if, if you're telling me these companies have been there for three years, I was not aware of no. that. We never received any information as a butters that this was going on. In the past year, it has been terrible. Yeah. And if they have known that there is some uh, uh, odor ordinance or odor, you know, they haven't been abiding by that. So they've been bad neighbors for a year. Okay, thank you, thank you both. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you, you back in the audience because, and I'm gonna try to. Thank you, gonna, thank you guys. Um, so, I, Liam, I'm gonna just since I'm the I'll I'll I will ask you as chair a few questions to hope sure. to help clarify from what I just got of the A. Where are these things allowed in Scarborough? And where they aren't allowed in Scarborough? And can you please explain why abutters are haven't known about it for the last couple of years? Sure. So let me let me take a, a try at that. So uh, in the, the, in the I'm sorry. Why the town hasn't notified abutters in the last few years? I'm sorry. Sure. So, yeah. So the first question around zoning that the ordinance does uh, prescribe or outline specific areas of town where uh, marijuana operations uh, can exist. And, and certainly one of those is the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District, which is sort of where I believe the Snow Canning Road facilities are located. Uh, so, so through the ordinance process, the ordinance committee was deliberate in where they thought it would be appropriate for marijuana operations to exist. And it's not just cultivation, also includes manufacturing or testing, although we haven't received any applications for that. So that is outlined in the, the ordinance. And again, Jean Marie could probably speak to some of the history on that specific subject. With regard to why abutters are being notified now, or more importantly, why they weren't notified previously, uh, under, under main law, uh, medical cultivators, so caregivers, uh, could cultivate their own plants, which is really the origin of this, of this sort of industry and these licenses. And they were permitted to uh, begin operations. And so that's why many of these operations have been in existence for years. And without the ordinance, there was really no obligation because there's no local requirement to notify abutters of these operations. And so what's really changed and why people are being notified now is because these, uh, these individuals are in the process of obtaining licenses in line with the ordinance. Um, had the town, and I think this is, we'll probably have some more discussion on this later, but had the town not opted in under state statute to allow marijuana establishments, uh, there would be no performance standards to, to hold a uh, license applicants to. And so uh, the operations could still exist as they have. Um, however, there'd be no notification to abutters. There'd be no performance standards. There'd be no licensing at the local level. And so um, I, I hope that that bit expanded, but I hope that sort of answers the question. What's really bringing this forward, these notifications, is our local licensing process that we're in the midst of. Thanks, Liam. That's helpful. So I'm going to try to I'm going to get this on the floor so we can discuss it. And, and so thank you. I'm oh, sorry. That was quick. Is there a second? Second. Thank now, uh, oh, hold on, hold on. I know we all want to talk. Uh, Jean Marie's going to go first because she's the chair of ordinance, and then uh, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, this was quite a process um, through the ordinance committee. Um, state laws are really very strange when it comes to medical marijuana versus adult use marijuana. Uh, I think Liam covered it very well, so I'm not going to add any more to that. I will say, frankly, that as chair of ordinance, um, the, this committee that approved these regulations, that I'm really disappointed in um, what seems to me, in my own experience, driving by Snow Canning Road is uh, an increase in the in the odor. Um, I I don't go down there frequently, but you know, in the last month or so, I've I've had opportunity to go down three or four times to the Pine Point area, different weather conditions, and I will tell you that it'll knock you over. I mean, so I'm very disappointed with this because I never noticed it before. I don't know, I, like the neighbors, I'm not sure what's going on, what the difference is, but I, I will put it out there that, because uh, most of these growers know me, uh, they sat in front of me for a while, um, and I, I'm just giving them the heads up. You gotta do something, man, because um, 
the licenses aren't going to last very long and there's got to be something that's got to be done and whether it's through the landlord or the individual growers i think all of them need to get together and 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 fix it because I, personally i think it's an issue and i don't live there but i drive through i've driven through there and i couldn't believe um the intensity of the odor that i have never noticed before so that's what my two cents worth thanks uh thank you council johnson yeah, a couple of things, if you don't mind. I want to, you know, it really struck home when I heard them say that they, they and, and I understand it, that they feel that this body uh, is there to protect them. Uh, the reality of it is that the, these guys have been growing there. Uh, there are no new additions with these licenses, and they could grow there before the ordinance. The ordinance is actually what we put in place to try to protect the residents. It's not that we just allow these guys to go in and do it and, and weren't thinking of you. That's why we have this ordinance. Uh, so there are no new ones. I do believe the process is to let everybody go through the licensing and then in some manner try to backtrack. I want to share just a little something with you. Mr. Councillor Hamill and I went and did a walkthrough of one of the growers. Okay. Uh, very nice gentleman. I won't mention his name, you know, his company name. And he brought us in and we walked through. Now, Granted, it was just one of, I think, 12 or 15, but they're all kind of similar. But he did share some information that I think that at some time we should workshop to educate ourselves on these growing techniques. That he said uh, the nature of the business is when they go to harvest the plant, you can imagine they, they're moved from one room into another room to harvest. And just the nature of that shakes the plant out, throws out all the spores, and really emits the odor much more potent than normal growing, okay? This individual guy, uh, business, they harvest every month. So if we have 15 in there, and they're all harvesting at different time periods, that's why at times we probably get an extra strengthening of that smell, I would think. And I think Maybe we just have to educate ourselves on that. I don't know what we could do about it. Maybe they could talk together, maybe try to start harvesting on the same days or on the same weekends. You don't know, maybe mitigate time space a little bit more. I did have one question for Liam, though, if I could. Liam, are you involved in the on-site review? I am. Okay, because I thought it was Jay and it's you. Could, could you just go over because uh, one of the requirements are odor mitigation. Could you just go over that process, what you look for? And the reason why I'm asking is because the, the one that Councilor Hamill and I went to, they had no external uh, air out, uh, push out. Their mitigation was to keep, to contain the smell in the building, which was, I thought, very novel. Uh, so, what yeah. is that process on the you know what are you looking for to make sure they're complying at least initially with mitigate mitigating the odor yeah if i could just take a step back so what the on-site inspection typically looks like is it's uh, myself along with our fire inspector um, generally our code enforcement officer with a with a background in uh, electrical and our zoning administrator along with a representative from the police department and really what we're doing is we're going through and verifying that the application materials that they submitted are, are indeed accurate to the degree we can we can determine that so we're reviewing their security plans obviously ahead of time we're verifying that they have adequate surveillance or camera setups we're verifying that you know all the the, the fine print of the ordinance with regard to the security plan general building code pieces. So this is very similar to uh, a certificate of occupancy would be. So we're making sure there's no fire code violations. And the order mitigation piece, you know, again, if you review the ordinance, you'll suggest, you know, you'll see that really there's a, a performance standard that needs to be met. There's really, the ordinance doesn't have specifics as to how that is met. So it doesn't uh, speak to internal ventilation versus external ventilation. It doesn't speak to any sort of magnitude or specificity around equipment. So essentially what we're doing is we're asking them through the inspection to say, you know, what do you have for odor mitigation systems in place? Can you point them out? Do they appear operational? But really what's going to have to happen here, and, and really where this is going to get tricky, is we're going to have evidence to suggest through 
likely a butter's uh, experiences that whatever systems are in place are, are inadequate. And then the question is, what do we do then? And so, um, you know, that's really the extent of it. We don't have a background uh, or an odor mitigation specialist on staff who can go in and, and determine that the equipment they have in place will indeed be um, adequate for that facility at that location with, uh, you know, it, it all is, is very, uh, there's quite a lot of variables to it. So the initial step is that um, point out the equipment, we determine it, it appears to be operational. And from there, it's going to be, well, is it in fact operational based on the, the sort of the anecdotal or, or reported experience of the abutters? Now we have some facilities that due to where they lie in town, uh, they don't have uh, abutters in the same way our snow canning facility appears to have. And so um, the odor, the odor uh, emanating from that, from that building may be on a similar level. However, they don't have residential properties within 500 or 1,000 feet. And so simply the experience is different. Um, so that is going to be an ongoing challenge with managing this or the enforcement of this ordinance. Any follow-up, Councillor Johnson, before I move on? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Hamill? Yeah, I live in Pine Point uh, and I am uh, very sympathetic to uh, the complaints and comments that we receive from residents. Uh, it is a problem. Uh, there's no question about it. The part of the difficulty is uh, these uh, have been grandfathered facilities. Uh, they were running before the legislation came into effect. And as Liam has explained, uh, it's been very hard for us to try to get a get a baseline to figure out, uh, you know, where the, you know, where the odors are coming from and where, you know, who has which systems in place. But hopefully by the licensing, we'll be able to establish a baseline. This, this is uh, not by itself necessarily going to resolve the, the odor problem. So I expect that this is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to take some, a while for us to sort our way through this. Um, as Councilor Johnson mentioned, we went through and inspected, uh, you know, very extensive um, odor mitigation systems in one facility. Uh, but there is just a lot of activity. Uh, you know, there are a dozen or so people in there and uh, the level of activity, how that has increased, I have no way of knowing. And I'm not sure we have good data on that either, um, you know, uh, from from any part of the town, town government or staff at this point. So uh, I know it's not really going to answer the question or resolve it, but I, I think this is something we need to work our way through and, and to find out, uh, you know, if it will improve and if not, then what we need to do about it over time. So I, you know, that's a long answer to a very short question about uh, what we're gonna do about odor, but uh, by its nature, it is a very difficult thing to, um, to manage. Um, and this area has been a commercial and an industrial zone for some time before marijuana, you know, we had canning facilities there, uh, you know, that were, you know, uh, pretty pungent and, uh, and relatives who worked there and, and also, uh, you know, there's currently continuing seafood processing there. They, you know, in and around the area, that's just a fact of life of living in Pine Point. Uh, but I, I understand and appreciate this is a, seems to be a new thing. It does seem to be a bigger issue than it was previously. Councilor Gleistein? Uh, yeah, so um, it's uh, no surprise. I'll be voting um, no tonight. I've voted no on all of this. And um, I uh, didn't ex didn't support the expansion of um, uh, marijuana in Scarborough. Um, the uh, licenses are being applied for because uh, uh, the all of these cultivators will go into adult use uh, growing, and this is part of the law. I agree with uh, Councilor Katarina. It's a very complicated law. Uh, for whatever reason, the state did not decide to join together and just say. You know, let's not have, let's not call this medical marijuana. Let's not call this adult use. It's, it is very complicated. So I think one thing for this council is we're going to really have to understand how this works a lot better. Do we have the right to um, limit the number of plants in these, um, you know, by each grower? Um, what, what can we regulate? Wh what state regulations are involved? Is there a state regulation related to odor? Um, or is that only at the local level? Um, I, I will be bringing forward um, an odor ordinance or an amendment to the good neighbor. 
um, because as Councillor Hamill pointed out, um, this is not just related to marijuana. Um, there were some residents uh, that I have talked with uh, in that area um, that had lived there for, well, it's a homestead. Uh, and so the, the person has been there for 70 years and family before that. Um, and it only became recent where there was a problem with one of the, the canning um, facilities causing odors that it never had before. So I don't think we have to just pick on uh, you know, the, the marijuana, but to me, the property owner, the landlords, um, in this case, in that other case, the, the, uh, the property was leased out to someone else, they have the accountability. And the way to solve this, in my opinion, is we get an ordinance in place, and if you're not in compliance, you get fined. That's the way ordinances work. So um, everyone likes to think that odor is very subjective, and it is, um, but I think there are some things we can put into place um, that will turn subjective data into something objective that we can consider for fining. Um, and again, it's not to, it's, you know, it's, it won't apply just to marijuana. It would apply, um, you know, to other parts of town. Um, I understand, you know, what you, the letter you read from Phil tonight, uh, Paul, you know, so basically Phil said, we have no right to turn down any of these um, licenses if they meet all the criteria. I do think legally that is correct based on my understanding of the laws, which um, I haven't looked into for a while, but as folks probably understand, I spent quite a bit of time on this uh, when I first became a counselor. Um, however, our same town attorney allowed us to put this in the ordinance that we would vote on these licenses. So I think that that gives us at least the leeway to table when we aren't understanding what's going on exa exactly, when we don't have the level of detail. Um, I think, you know, you know, Councilor Johnson said, you know, it's the same number. I don't know that we know that. I think Councilor Hamill expressed it much better. Um, he said we didn't have a good baseline to start. And I think that's absolutely accurate. We don't totally know what's going on. I think um, uh, uh, Liam expressed very well, they're not experts in a lot of things. There's a lot of things to be learned about this new business from a state and a local level. Um, and so uh, if there are uh, issues, you know, I think we can slow down. I think we can table. Um, I think we can vote no. Uh, again, the same town attorney signed off on us putting a vote in this. So um, I'm not sure why he didn't bring forward. Well, you know, you could vote, but it won't mean anything. So in my book, it does mean something. I voted no on all of these. Um, I will be voting no again tonight. I urge other people to vote no, or at least we table it until we get to the bottom of some of these issues, because I don't really think it's an answer to say, we're just gonna keep letting it go and figure it out later. So that's my two cents, thanks. Thank you. Councilor Clucci. Uh, yeah, Paul, I hope you don't mind. I'm gonna share a bit of our conversation um, uh, this morning and yesterday because it helped to give me a little clarity into the process and kind of where we are. Um, you know, I, I think, Betsy, to your point, we can do whatever we want. You can vote how you want. I, I don't think anybody can, uh, you know, control how you vote, but the, there could be repercussions to how you do it and how you approach it. So I, uh, I actually do support um, moving this forward and, and kind of where the, the, where I was complaining to Paul yesterday was how can staff be coming to us saying these are meeting all of the performance standards when we're getting all these complaints about odor um, down the road. And uh, it didn't really click for me until I realized that when you're going for the application, you can't really judge whether they're complying with the smell performance standards because technically they're not licensed yet. Um, once they're licensed, then they could be in violation. And I think the way I'm interpreting our ordinance is that the, um, the growers at Snow Canning Road that uh, we've already granted licenses to are now out of compliance with those performance standards. Uh, and I, I think the approach that um, council leadership has uh, been kind of following is probably a good one for this. And that's, let's get them all licensed. And if uh, they're all, you know, if, if the problem's still not better, then, uh, you know, the way I'm reading it, they're all out of compliance. And then I think Liam addressed some of the uh, actions that can be taken if that's found to be the case. Uh, <clears throat> so I do support moving this forward. And I think uh, Councilor Johnson, Ken Johnson did a good job of explaining that this is this is how we're protecting or trying to protect uh, the, that neighborhood. Um, if we had chose not to go with an ordinance, they could be doing it anyways, and there'd be no 
um, no regulations or we'd have no enforcement arm. Um, so it's a complicated topic. It's a complicated subject. I, I feel like we're talking way too much about marijuana, um, honestly, at the council level. And I, I hope that that's something that we can kind of consider or, or take a look at for an amendment or a change down the road. Um, there's other things out there that uh, I'd, I'd like us to spend some focus on. So. Thank you. Anybody else? So I'm gonna I'm gonna take my opportunity just because I get to I'm gonna share my screen real quick <laughs> um, because I think the, the way I'm looking at this is a requirement to get the license is to have an odor mitigation system period okay they have that we license them then because they're licensed they are then required not to have their order go beyond the property line that's when our power actually comes in and if we look I'm gonna just show the I'm gonna share the ordinance for a second. If we look at these violations and penalties right here, it says any violation of this ordinance, including the operation of a marijuana establishment license without a valid local license and failure to comply with any condition, shall be subject to a civil penalty of a minimum of $100, a maximum of $2,500, and that's for every single day they're out of compliance. Uh, so that is a massive fine. Um, so to me, the right play here is you check the box. Yes, they have an order mitigation. Then the question is, is it good enough? And if it's not good enough, then we, then we take action. I would even suggest after our January workshop, this sounds a little extreme, but as an example, take the January workshop, we could at the next council meeting, put it every single one of these guys individually up for a re revocation of their license and, and either say yes or no in each and every single one of them. I'm not saying we, th we do that, but that's an example of the power we are then given. Because once we revoke somebody's license and then they continue to operate, they're faced with a $100 to a $2,500 fine from us per day that they're doing that. So um, so that's where I am. Logically, we just have to get this thing. Yes, they have odor mitigation. And then the next question is, are they violating? And so that that's, that's kind of my long-term, I think Don and I have discussed it. That's why we're having this workshop in January. This is certainly not going away. In fact, it's gonna be more fruitful once we get these guys licensed and say, okay, what's happening? And I'm sure a few of them are watching this. So I hope that they are aware there's a lot of time and energy on our end spending to make sure they got a sh fair shake in the marijuana ordinance. Well, now it's time to see, make sure the residents have a fair shake with the implementation of that. So we're, we're on the other side of this, so to speak, right? We spent hours and hours and hours with the growing community and not a ton except for just some public hearing stuff with the residents. Well, now our role switches from trying to make it work to enforcer and we need to get to the role of enforcer next. And we're just not quite there yet until they're all licensed. So. And Paul and Paul, that's why I made the comments I made. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, come on, you know, we've worked really hard with everyone up to this point. You've heard now there's an issue. So the landlord and tenants need to start addressing this because yeah, we are gonna do crack we will crack down in January if we have to. Right. So like I said, we can vote. Up. We, can, we, can up. Take, we can take twenty seven votes in January on each one of these guys. But that would go against Coochie's desire not to talk about so much marijuana. <laughs> Does anybody have anything to add to that before I take a vote? No? Okay, Tom, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we're voting on these. Yes, you are. I thought you were yeah. <laughs> recognizing me for comment. Yeah. Councillor Clucci? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. Councillor Gleistein? No. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, on to new business, order number 20094. It's an act on the following request pursuant to Title 23 MRSA 3025 and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance. Chamberlain Construction Incorporated petitions the Scarborough Town Council to accept the public infrastructure within phase three of the Dunstan subdivision as known on the plan above by the planning board on November 19th, 2012. The town council accepted the infrastructure associated with phases one and two of the project and to accept McCann Lane, excuse me, McCann Way and Larry Falls Drive as public ways. Uh, Tom? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is actually a fairly routine matter. Um, at the time of subdivision approval, the developer expresses their 
uh, interest and intent to construct roads to our specifications with the expectations that we'll accept them. And we have an ordinance that dictates uh, all of those particulars. Um, I can tell you, this is an ongoing challenge for staff. Um, there are years that pass. And in this case, uh, I believe nearly all the lots are, have been built on and fully occupied. So uh, we are anxious to get to this point and uh, we've uh, done all the requisite inspections to, uh, along the way during construction and then now after time has passed to, to ensure that the roads are sufficient to meet our requirements. And so the matter is before you to formally accept them. And with that acceptance um, comes our responsibility to therefore maintain those uh, that infrastructure. I will say that Angela Blanchett, who is here and can be available if you wish, is working very hard with developers all over town um, uh, to do this. So you'll likely see a wave of these over the course of the fall and early winter. Uh, they're anxious to get this done uh, in advance of snow season. Uh, remains to be seen if they'll accomplish all the particulars that need to be done. But this is a concentrated effort um, on the part of staff to really move these through uh, and get them to council's uh, attention. Thank you. Any questions for Tom about this before I put it on the table? Uh, Councilor Johnson? Yeah, Tom, I was just wondering if you could uh, ask Angela as she's doing this this exercise, if she could just track the uh, total road mileage on that. Certainly. Thank you. Um, you would you like that part of the, the report that comes to you so you have a sense of what, uh, what the magnitude of the infrastructure is you're accepting? Yes, that would that'd be nice. Sure, Thank we you. can add that too as a matter of uh, the memorandum that will, will uh, come with each and every one of these. I think in this case, it's 0.4 miles. Any other questions for Tom? Councilor Hamill? Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, uh, ask Tom some questions on this and um, you know, I'm pretty confident this is a uh, you know pretty routine matter, but I was kind of curious, are these the last streets to be accepted in that uh, development? No, this probably, uh, Angela can speak to it, but it's, uh, it's phase three at most. Uh, I think it might even be phase two. So now there's quite a few phases yet to yet to come. And in many cases, we don't want to accept the road too quickly because as lots are still being uh, developed with heavy machinery coming and going, uh, we really work very hard to make sure that we're accepting a pristine product. Um, and uh, Angela works tirelessly to make sure that happens. So there's all sorts of reasons that there are, uh, are delays uh, for this to happen. Um, but in this case, uh, these roadways are, are ready to be accepted. Okay. And then the other question that I had, and Tom, you'd answer this, but it, you know, it's uh, not, a, not a precise response, but obviously there's going to be some expense to the town for doing this. We're going to be plowing streets and maintaining them. So do you have any idea, you know, what the budget impact would be from, from this or from what the competitive uh, acceptance might be, you know, adding in other developments? Yeah, I mean, it, it will it will be incremental. I mean, uh, you know, roads of, of, of this uh, uh, length um, and keep in mind they're in good condition when we're accepting them. So in the early years, it's kind of incremental to um, our overall operations. We're not adding staff or equipment per se, but over time that certainly is uh, will happen. Internally, we use uh, about $4,000 per mile per year for public work expense. Uh, and that can be equated, uh, and then for trash collection, it's $155 uh, per household per year as well. Um, okay. Again, I, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the folks that purchase uh, homes uh, have a uh, reasonable expectation that these roads would become public as well. Yeah. So uh, that's part of the challenge that Angela's often facing is that we have folks that have been living in their house for years yet the road is not yet um, uh, accepted. And that's issue that has issues of trash collection, uh, bus stops. There's all sorts of challenges that come with this uh, period of limbo. Tom, one final point here, and, and this may not be an easy question for you to answer, but I, I mean, I, we do we expect that, that uh, is it impact fees or what exactly from the developers did the town get in the way of funding to help offset uh, the cost associated with us accepting streets. Yeah. Impact fees would not pertain to the to this. Uh, the theory is uh, the additional tax revenue uh, will go to support and offset the additional.
cost to provide municipal services. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very yeah. much. And, and Tom, it, it does, right? The tax revenue from this particular subdivision definitely does offset these costs of accepting these roads. Oh, and for certain for, for public works related expenses, but I think you need to look more globally at uh, public safety costs, at school costs. So this is right, just a slight- Whether or not we accept the roads, they're entitled to schools and public safety, right? So the, the you know- um, Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I don't look at that overall formula, but you know, I, I think that like you're saying, there's a reasonable expectation that people have that they're gonna become public roads and that's the tax rate we pay in town. Correct, yeah. correct. So, uh, and, and to your point, I, I didn't mean to be evasive whatsoever. Uh, yes, uh, it, even with single family uh, residential, there is certainly um, sufficient tax revenue produced by the development of lots and building of homes uh, to offset these expenses, yes. Councilor Johnson. Yeah, I, I don't want to derail the meeting, but just there's a couple folks in this, just a little tidbit of information from 97 to 2007, because of development in this town, we added 56 miles for public works to surface, to service, 56 miles. So. Again, just another key, clearing, glaring fact that growth is bigger than schools. And I'll end it, it on that. No, 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 you won't, because how much tax value did we add? I have to add that, but anyway. <laughs> just pull your way. This was not an ROI. This was just a statement of fun facts. Thank you. Well, we'll have to double check to see if that's fact, right? <laughs> The, the, the one thing I will say, not to be argumentative, but uh, this, the uh, Crossroads District is a good example. There will be a total of eight miles at full build out for uh, as many as 3,000 homes and all the associated non-residential uses. So there's something to be said for compact, more dense development uh, to keep those infrastructure costs minimized. Any other derails before we put it on the table? <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> I, I'm teasing everybody. I don't care about anybody. In fact, it's not even on the table yet, right? So do I have a motion? <laughs> Did I already? There's no There's no motion. Right? No motion. Okay. Somebody? It's all moved. <laughs> second. <clears throat> second. I was going to make Councillor Johnson second it. But <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom, you want to call the vote? Councillor Clucci. Yes. Councillor Hayes. Yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. And Chairman Johnson. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, on to something very positive. This is order number 20095. It's an act and request to accept a donation from Raz Hamid in the amount of $2,000 for use in the town parks. And I apologize ahead of time if I butchered your name, sir. Um, Tom, do you want to just tell us? the where this came from or yeah i don't really have any backstory uh included in your packet is the the letter uh that was included with the check um i think by my understanding of the letter this individual uh, happens to frequently use municipal park and has been um enamored by uh the care and custody that we've provided and so much so he's willing to provide a donation to uh to advance that so very pleased to accept it Um, let's put it on the table before we talk about it. Let's, so moved. Let's, let's get some order back in this meeting here. <laughs> okay. So moved. <laughs> Second. Councilor Gleistein. Second. Uh, yeah. So this is, this is fantastic. Um, I've had a, a, an occasion to look into, uh, donations to municipalities and, um, I'm not a tax attorney or a tax specialist, but um, based on everything that I've been involved with, this is tax deductible for people. So I would, you know, encourage um, us to look into that as well and send a receipt to this person. Um, if indeed that information that I had gathered under a different um, circumstance is accurate. And I think that, um, it's something that it's 
fantastic, it's much appreciated and something that we should pursue more often because I think, you know, if we had a fill you know, a philanthropic philanthropic effort or committee or something like that. There are a lot of people who Scarborough is their heart, whether or not they're full-time residents here, it might be, it might be homes that they had for a hundred years in their family and they are looking for, or would be open to, um, especially if we identify certain, uh, improvements, you know, that, that would be helpful, um, to, have funded. Uh, so I think it's an effort that 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 we should pursue at some point um, as a town and as a council. There's experts out there that do it. I, I happen to know one. I don't know that she would uh, do it, but um, you know, this is um, something that you can see here. Someone looked at it and said, you know, I'm so grateful. This is awesome. This is somewhere that I would like to contribute. And I guarantee you this person is not alone out there when it comes to the, our town. Just so you know, our, we don't typically send a receipt per se, but we certainly send a letter of acknowledgement. And I think it really serves the same purpose. It serves as a right. yeah, validation. The yeah. wrong term, but it, 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 it should be, and anyone should check with their own tax attorney. Sure. It should be tax deductible, so. I believe you're correct. Councilor Geistein? I already talked, thanks. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> she gets another chance. <laughs> I was on autopilot. Councilor Katarina? I don't know about you, Paul. What's going on? Too much multitasking up there. Uh, anyway. I after the workshop, I promise. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Hamid uh, for this generous donation. Um, I, I, I agree with him. I walk in Memorial Park two or three times uh, a week. I enjoy walking there. I've run into fellow counselors there uh, at times. Um, and I think that all of our parks and recreation areas in town are very valuable. And I just want to thank him very much for that donation. Councilor Johnson. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank him too. I tell you this, this actually almost cared me up. Uh, I, I don't know why. If you know, I, I basically almost live in the park. And uh, I agree with what he says in his, his letter. The our community service does a stellar job in that park. And, and just to share something, because I live in the proximity of the park I do, uh, one thing that COVID, I, I noticed, and it was COVID driven, you know, it was after months of being cooped up in the house, with the family as much as we like to. I really noticed this summer, the utilization of our park really went up. And several times when I'd cross the street, there's a little mound over there with a, with a, uh, with a sign and you can stand and you can actually see the whole span of the park. And to see the dozens of family blankets out just having picnics, and you really notice that our town is really becoming a very diverse, town and it which really is something that's long overdue i mean the, the, the they make up and the mixture of the folks just enjoying the park was was, was quite something this summer i really enjoyed it but i wanted to thank that gentleman again really appreciate it good all right with that tom councilor clucci yes and thank you councilor hayes yes councilor gleistein yes Councilor Katarina. Yes, thank you. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. Chairman Johnson. Yes, and thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, item number nine is non-action items. There are none. Item number 10 is standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. So please raise your hand if you have one. Councilor Katarina. Uh, yeah, very quickly, long range planning. Uh, we met, we'll be meeting again November 6th. We are working on getting the comprehensive plan out uh, to public, uh, for public input. And uh, our next meeting, what did I just say? It was November 6th. They don't have the dates yet. We're working on the dates to get public input. In normal times, we'd go around to different parts of town, literally, and meet at the different schools or fire stations or whatever, 
But with COVID, um, the plan is to have different evenings and opportunities and even daytime for people to get on Zoom. And potentially, I mentioned the, the, uh, that they should consider doing a hybrid, some sort of a hybrid thing where people can come in to town hall if they wanted to, as well as be on Zoom. So uh, stay tuned uh, for that, because um, as you know, we, we really need to get that out the door. Um, and then tomorrow, uh, ordinance committee is meeting at four. We're gonna, I've been asked and asked and asked to bring something up about fireworks where, so I've got fireworks on there. I'm not sure what will happen, if anything yet, but at least I wanna open the door for folks to, to begin discussions. And then um, the big thing is growth management. And there was a whole list of data points um, Jay sent us back, I don't know how many pages. I know Dawn, you, you were gonna read them today. I read them the other day, but uh, it should be an interesting um, beginning to collect data on uh, what uh, the effects of growth are in town and move on from there. So that's four o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Any other committee or liaison reports? No? All right, I have a slightly long one, so I apologize. Uh, number one is the leadership meeting is tomorrow. Uh, Don, I, and Tom have, I think I've mentioned this, but we have our leadership meeting on Thursdays on uh, council weeks, just because it makes a lot more sense on our end. Um, so I'll hopefully report out to you um, sometime tomorrow or early Friday. Uh, secondly, which we're gonna talk about at the leadership meeting, so excuse me, I don't have all the details. Uh, but we have set a tentative date um, for December 8th. That would actually be a special town council meeting. So we're utilizing an off Wednesday. And that is going to be a workshop with um, um, GCOG, GPCOG, Greater Portland Council of Governments, um, and a couple of transit providers, as long as some representatives from PACS to uh, just discuss um, the downs and how public transport is, uh, the challenges of public transport at the downs, the benefits, um, and just the viability of public transport in general, and also the type of um, how all that can affect growth and how growth interplays with that. So we're bringing in a couple of outside voices, outside perspectives to just sit around and uh, get educated and, and, and hopefully pepper them with some questions. But I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times. The date is December 8th and the refined agenda will be to follow. Um, but again, it's just one more step in us trying to wrap our rain, brain around the regional impact and uh, enormity of the Downs project. Uh, I did call Peter Mishu, uh, one of the uh, developers of the Downs and requested from him. It was a very quick phone conversation. I did request from him if they could do some sort of five-year projection of number of units that they think they're going to do, um, residential units. I know we get a lot of input, uh, a lot of numbers from them and a lot of um, hype around the commercial growth and all that great stuff that we want. But I think in the GMO discussions, it would make sense for us to have this, uh, to just have a their perspective on what they perceive would be their five-year plan, so to speak. Um, he reported back that he has that, you know, he has three years of that done. So he'd be willing to extrapolate two more years or, or take a crack at it. More to come on that. I haven't, I haven't heard from him since, but I made that call, I think three or four days ago. Uh, lastly, I'm going to close the um, comp plan uh, FAQs on Friday. So everybody get in your comp plan FAQs. It is in the shared Google folder. I will make it public. It is for public consumption once we're done with it. Um, and if you're, in the, if you're listening right now, essentially we have a workshop on the comp plan in early November. And I've solicited the feedback from individual counselors uh, so we just have it all in one place. Once it is finished, I will gladly make it part of the agenda packet coming up. So my four things, leadership meeting tomorrow, special town council meeting on December 8th about the regional effects, benefits, cost of the downs and specifically transit and growth. Talk to Peter Mishu about getting some sort of um, forecast on their end of the number of units in the next three to five years and comp plan thoughts are closed on Friday. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, item number 11 is Councillor Remember comments. Anybody wanna raise their hands? Does anybody have any comments? Councillor Katarina. Um, just a reminder to everyone to vote. Um, and I know Tom mentioned it at the top of the hour, the top of the hour, listen to me, I sound like a newscaster, um, that we are having extended voting and registration this Saturday 
from eight to noon. Uh, so please, you know, make note of that. If you've been wondering how, when you're gonna fit this into your schedule, uh, let other people know. It's very easy to, to register and vote. And we do have that special drop-off box in the front of the building, which I'm glad people are feeling comfortable enough using. So um, no excuses this year, folks. Come on out and vote. Thanks. Any others? Councillor Geising? Sorry, I muted you. Yeah, Can no, you I well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I mentioned, uh, I believe it was the last meeting um, that uh, I, I was hoping the council would consider expanding um, these ad hoc committees um, to more, uh, to have, to include more members. And uh, my lot reasoning is a lot of the model that we talk about that works so well is the committee um, for the community center. Uh, and there were several subcommittees on that, uh, which made the work very outstanding because they had a small group that could participate in some detailed level work without completely overwhelming the entire committee. So I'm not putting forward anything right now, sure, uh, clearly, but um, I do plan to ask the chair to help me figure out how to bring that forward. Um, so that is uh, something I want to get out there. Um, also with uh, the comp plan and uh, long range coming up um, and in the time of COVID, um, you know, this is, um, we've had the last comp plan since 2006. Um, it's quite impactful on our town, our zoning, our ordinances, our quality of life. Um, and so it is unfortunate that we are in the circumstance that we're in, um, but uh, Zoom, I think is not a great forum for getting feedback. Um, there are many people who struggle with it and we even have some staff members who struggle with it. I, like Paul, I think you need to give some lessons to everyone cause like you're like a master of it. Like you're very, very good at it but not everyone is that good at it. And then on the other end, people struggle as well. So I definitely think we need to find ways to spread this out over uh, a couple of, you know over more than more than one month for sure. but. Um, you know, and kind of see how things are going. A, a lot of people have some concern about the winter coming. Let's see how that shakes out. Um, but spread out, um, you know, in a big, tall area, uh, social distance, mask, and, um, you know, make sure that we're, we're getting some input in person because, you know, there's body language too. There's people raising their hand. There's people wanting to speak more than once. And um, while this has been a good, uh, a good tool for local government to be the pretty much the only level of government that's gotten a lot done, I will uh, say in our defense <laughs> compared to the other levels of government. Um, it is, it's got its limitations. Um, and so uh, I just think we need to be very cognizant of that. Um, we originally, this was gonna come out every 10 years, which would have been 16 and 18, it got put aside. Um, and now I think we need to be very careful of saying, well, we've waited so long on it. Now we have to try to get it out in the middle of, you know, an extraordinary lifetime event. So um, those are my uh, two cents yet again. And I will not call on you immediately afterwards. I'm sorry. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I'll say more. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Anybody? Nope. Okay. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Tom. Ooh. All right. Tom? Councilor, Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes. Yes. Councilor Gleinstein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Oh, yes. Councilor Johansson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. Chairman Johnson. Yes.